to God. Hallelujah. because we rush in so quickly sometimes that you don't realize that you're in the presence of almighty God. There is a reverence of fear that needs to come back to the house of God where our total attention is given to him because he is an awesome God. No one else deserves that description, that honor, that praise, that worth, that strength. He's awesome. So let's be intentional about his presence. That whatever we're doing, if it's anything other than giving him attention, 
I stop and go ahead and give him attention, amen? Because he's here. Sing it with your full heart.
to you for a few minutes this morning about ministry of restoration. All of us are familiar with the 23rd Psalm. We know that he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. Would you say that with me? He restores my soul. God is in the business of restoration. He doesn't throw us away. But sometimes I'm like that clay that the potter puts on the wheel that he has to take it off and pound it a little bit and reshape it and try it again because I resist being formed into his image. But as they used to sing here, he doesn't throw the clay away. There's a passage in Matthew 12, 20 that is actually a quote from Isaiah chapter 42, verse 3, and it's speaking about Jesus, and it said, A bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quince, till he sends forth justice or judgment to victory. And Jesus is saying here, it's saying about Christ when he sees those who are broken, those who are wounded, he is not going to throw them away. Matter of fact, he's going to bind them up. He's going to bring restoration. And that, that tree that you thought would never bear fruit again, how many know when he restores, he restores. Amen. So the smoking flax, he will not quince. That means if there's just a spark left. Some of you used to be on fire for God, and now just a little bit of smoke. You know what I'm saying? But he's not going to extinguish what is there. Instead, the breath of the Holy Spirit will begin to breathe on what's left in that smoke and He will fan a flame that will burst back into fire. And I want you to know in this building today, no matter what you're walking through, where you've been, God wants to bring you to a place of restoration to where you're better than you ever were before. Amen. Amen. 
So he's a God of restoration and God's people, point number two, should be a people of restoration. Listen to Paul's instructions in Galatians 6, 1 through 3. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, King James says fault. Everybody say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If anyone is overtaken in a fault, a trespass, I want to stop there. There, uh, The Greek word there is paraptoma, which means a slide, a slip, a fall, an offense, a sin, or a trespass. Sometimes intentional, sometimes unintentional, right? Anybody unintentionally slip and fall? Do something you wish you hadn't? Oh, God help us. If a man is overtaken, back to the passage, in a trespass, you who are spiritual... Gossip about them to everybody else and talk about how you knew they'd never make it anyway. Amen. Is that what we do? Talk to, listen, if you don't have the guts to go to somebody that's hurting, that's fallen, that's made mistakes, and try to bring restoration to them, keep your mouth off of them to everybody else. Amen. Watch this, and, and go in humility. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Amen. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Listen to how the New Living says it. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin... You who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Be careful that you don't fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens. In this way, obey the law of Christ. For if you think you're too important to help somebody else, you're, not, you're just fooling yourself. You ain't all that important. I, I'll let you say that to whoever you're sitting next to, too. Huh? You know, I have watched as a pastor, uh, we had a lady that attended church years ago, and she's always so judgmental and harsh of everybody else. Well, I'd never do that. And one Sunday I preached a message. I said, everybody who's ever started out walking for the Lord and lived for God at any, for any amount of time has backslid a little bit from time to time. Amen. Now, backsliding doesn't mean turning and going the other way. It means, oop, I slipped back a little bit. Right? And she came to me afterwards. She said, Pastor, I'll have you know that since I've started serving God, I've only moved forward. I've never gone back a bit. And she wound up totally backslid because let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Her attitude of judging everybody else that made a mistake just set her up because the Bible said pride goes before a fall. And so don't get all arrogant and think when somebody else does something that you know is wrong, quit, quit judging and gossiping and go to them and say, you know what, I love you enough to let you know that God can restore you. Amen. Amen. David sinned grievously in, in the Old Testament. You're familiar with his story. You know, he should have been at war. Instead, he was at home and Went up on the, maybe went up on the rooftop to pray. I stood there and looked where David stood in Jerusalem, and, and all you can see is rooftops. And you know the story with Bathsheba and how if he'd have kept his eyes on the Creator instead of the creation, he'd have been all right. Amen? This was a man after God's own heart. This was a man who had it literally... Uh, brought so many people to worship who had restored the worship in the tabernacle and God had used him so mightily and yet he falls grievously into sin and the prophet Nathan shows up and he comes to restore. Now he doesn't gloss over his sin. Matter of fact, he shows us our nature. You all know the story. Nathan comes to him and he says, you know, uh, in your kingdom was a man that had this uh, one little lamb, this little ewe lamb, and he was really poor. And that lamb was like a child to him. He loved that lamb like family. And this wealthy man lived next door. When a friend came to visit, he went and took that poor man's little ewe lamb instead of choosing from his own flocks. And David got all self-righteous. Isn't it funny when we think it's the other guy? <laughs> he said, whoever that man is, he should be executed. It just needs to be rest restoration. What an evil thing to do. And the prophet said, you're the man. 
You're the one. Sometimes we need somebody to speak into our lives and not just say, oh, honey, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I'm not going to say anything to offend you. Uh, let me tell you something. The Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. I want people on my council, folks in my life, that if they see me getting off track and going the wrong direction, that they'll care enough to come to me about it. And Nathan begins to warn him, but then he tells him about the consequences of what he's done. But he doesn't cast him aside. He doesn't do away with him. He doesn't say, too, too late for you now. And what did David do after the prophet came to him? David said, create in me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Say this with me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. I want to say that again. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with your generous spirit. You know what I'll do then? If you forgive me, Lord, and you restore me after the way I messed up, I'm going to help others. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted Unto you. James says it this way. James 5, 19 and 20. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and tell everybody about their sin. Huh? Cover a multitude of sins. Now, I want you to notice the text here. It doesn't say if somebody that's never been saved. It says somebody that has been saved. Somebody that wanders from the truth. And, and I want you to understand something. God's forgiveness is instantaneous, but restoration is a process. My wife has an eye for furniture that other people think is junk. She'll get it for $15 or $20 or, or free. And when she's done with the restoration process, it's worth hundreds. And it's not an easy or slow process. Believe me, I've gone through this with her countless times now. Number one, she sees the value. There's something she restored. That thing had six coats of paint on it, I believe. And she used oven cleaner and zip strip and all kinds of stuff. And uh, I won't tell you that I teased her about a stripper in the garage. But, <laughs> but after she, I'm going to get in trouble one of these days. But after you go strip off all the facade, all the finish that shouldn't be there. You know what I'm talking about? How many know instead of getting restored, we just cover up? Yeah. Somebody just kept painting this thing over. We had to take it apart. It, it, Tom helps me sometimes. And, and we had to put the drawers back together with glue and clamps and straps. And everything had to be redone. And when it's finished, it's a beautiful piece of furniture. Amen. But you don't just strip all the old off. How many know you have to put a new finish on so it doesn't stain the next time you set a cup on it? She put a glass top on that, and she just did a really good job. So you, you see the value. How many thank God that God sees the value in you, even when you do wrong, even when you're messed up? Then the paint is stripped away. Don't just paint it over. The prophet Nathan didn't go into David and just gloss it over and say, Oh, your majesty, you're the king, so, you know, I'm your friend, so I'll make excuses for you. You make excuses for somebody, you keep them away from restoration. Then there's the repairing, the removing of the old finish, the sanding, the finishing. And, and anybody ever work with polyurethane? You put that first coat on, it looks so nice, and then it dries all splotchy looking, and you have to lightly sand it and, then, and put it on again and then again. Aren't you glad God don't give up on you? And so not long ago, uh, I want you to see something here. My friend Jeff Carpenter, him and Penny, gave us this old, Veneer covered chest. Where's that at? That's kind of rough looking, isn't it? Yeah. 
My wife said, I want that. They said, well, I don't think anybody would want that. I learned about from getting online, I learned about four or five ways that you can take veneer off something. Some of you just need the veneer removed, you know. Don't go to that next picture until I'm ready. I thought I had most of it. And then Rick come by the garage and he said, you realize there's still veneer on the front of this thing. You know what? There's some beautiful cedar on the inside. Did you know cedar was used in Solomon's temple? You know, the Bible says the righteous will flourish like the cedars of Lebanon. Anybody ever open a cedar chest 20 years old and you still smell that fresh smell? Isn't that an awesome wood? So underneath all of this veneer, underneath all of this mess and these coats of finish was some beautiful cedar. And we kept on until we got it down to that. Now you can put the next picture up. And here's what it looks like now. See, Tammy had an eye to see the value in this piece of furniture. Then she felt so bad it looked so nice she tried to give it back to Jeff and Penny. <laughs> but I, I'm using this on purpose because, folks, a lot of us, our veneer is coming loose. Who we pretended to be, people are seeing through it. And God's saying, I put something beautiful inside you and you don't need the veneer. Are you hearing me? You need to be who I've created you to be. And it's going to take some grinding. It's going to take some sanding. It's going to take some repair and some work and some bringing things back together. But when I'm done with you, I'm going to use you in the kingdom of God for my honor and for my glory because I am a God who restores. I was young, a lot younger. I used to, uh, several times I'd get an old upright piano that the keys stick, felt it's not right. And if the pin block and the soundboard is good, some of you will know what I'm talking about, it can be restored. And there's something in it. And several times I have worked months on them. And finally, when I'm done... And I get it tuned. I used to even do that, but it takes too long. I don't have time for that anymore. But when I get it done, it's a beautiful instrument that's of great value. But before, you wouldn't give $20 for it. Matter of fact, you'd have to pay the junk man to haul those heavy things away. But when they're restored, they produce music. I'm telling you something, folks. God has a, a, a melody in your heart. I looked at a guitar that Logan refinished. A couple of weeks ago, I have another friend, Dorsey Gillum. He'll take guitars out of the trash. He'll straighten those warp necks. He'll check the frets. How many know if the frets aren't right, it discords? You fretting and discording? I thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> huh? And Dorsey will get that out of the trash. He'll work on that, and when he's done with that, it's worth sometimes... Over $1,000, something that somebody threw away because somebody else cared enough to see value in it and said, I'm not going to see that in the trash. I'm going to bring that back to its original purpose. I can restore. Somebody needs to hear this. You're worried about kids and grandkids and it looks like they'll never be right. He is a God of restoration. Restoration is a process. Sometimes it's painful. But it's beautiful. There was an old hymn mom and dad used to sing. And the second verse goes like this. And I think about this when I look at a restored guitar or violin or piano. It said, all my life was wrecked with sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. It's painful for me to listen to guitars and banjos and basses that are out of tune. Discord. How many know God hates it when people cause discord? Amen. said, all my life was wrecked with sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. Listen to this verse. Jesus swept across those broken strings and stirred those slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. He'll restore you. Amen. I'm just so appreciative that there are times when I... Did you ever give up on yourself and he still didn't give up on you? And boy, I'm just a mess. 
Listen. God is looking for people who will restore others. Who will see the intrinsic value. Do you remember the parable of the lost coin? The woman had to, to uh, the lost piece of silver. She had to light a lamp and search the house. Even though that silver coin was lost and dirty, did you know it still had the same value as when it was found? You hear me? You know you bear the image of your creator. And even if you're not where you ought to be, you're valuable to him. You still bear his image. And he wants to restore you. You all remember the first verse I talked to you about? I talked to you about a bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quince. We're going to go to the same chapter in Isaiah. And we're going to go down to verse 21. Isaiah 42, 21. God is looking for those who will care enough to restore. Say that with me. God is looking for those who will care enough to restore. The Lord is well pleased for His righteousness sake. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. But this is a people robbed and plundered. They are snared in holes. They're hidden in prison houses. They are for a prey. How many know that's a condition of a lot of folks? They have no resistance against temptation, against Satan, against evil. They haven't been taught anything. Nobody's cared enough. They're hidden in prison houses. They are for prey. No one delivers for plunder. Listen to this. And no one says, restore. Did you hear it? Now, God has a question for you. Anybody ever question God? Have you heard this message today? Listen to the question God has for you. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will listen and hear for a time to come? Is there anybody here that says, you know what? Sometimes I've been hurt by people. You know, why God, you know why the devil has people betray you and hurt you a lot? So you just give up on people and never care about anybody. So you won't do the things that God's called you to do. But I'm telling you folks, God's going to have a people who want to be part of restoration. They want to help people back, not put people down. They want to bring people back to the beauty and the glory that God had for them. Just like that old cedar chest, when you look at it and you see the veneer, my question is, why'd they put that veneer on it to start with? Amen. Amen. So let's get rid of the veneer. Let's look at people and say, hey, you know what? God has an original intent and purpose for you. He wants to take you from being a vessel of dishonor and make a vessel of honor out of you. He wants to restore you. David says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. You know, you can read stories about the Apostle Paul. How many know he was a very wicked man before he was saved, but thought he was right in what he was doing? But when you read about people who walked with God and then fell away, folks will have pretty much mercy on folks unless they're leaders. And then because we're called to an example, we're called to a higher standard, and that's true. But folks, I want you to know God can restore yes. even fallen Christians. People who have walked with the Lord and slipped and messed up. God doesn't just kick you out of the family. Now there's a process. It's painful. But can you see by those two examples I gave you that it's really worth it? Stand with me. Let God bring restoration into your life. I want to read this again. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. But this is a people robbed and plundered. All of them are snared in holes. They are hidden in prison houses. They are for a prey. No one delivers for plunder. And no one says, restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will listen and hear for the time? yet to come. Father, let these words that you've given me to share today burn deep into our hearts.
cause all of us, when we see a brother or sister fall, not to push them down or to kick them while they're down. God, we should not be an army that executes its own wounded. But help us to minister grace and goodness to those who are fallen and see the ability and the testimony and the power and the presence you bring out of vessels that you have restored. May we hear the melody of your love flowing through the instruments of restoration in this house this morning. In Jesus' name. Oh, my God. 